Hello, everyone. Thank you for choosing to listen to uh, this installation of Fiat Language dealing with the character that is often called today Bet. Although uh, I am mostly going to choose to call it B. I will be doing this continually as I go through all of these characters in the ancient Hebrew. Uh, for one reason, uh, it's to show you just how close a language modern English is to ancient Hebrew. As I've stated before, it is my current belief that modern English is the most Shemitic living language that there is. If you know of one that is more Shemitic, uh, feel free to let me know in the comments. Feel free to criticize anything that you find to be inaccurate. And uh, moreover, I, w I would implore any of you who have come to this channel either because of knowing um, my views concerning, for lack of a better term, flat earth or um, other things that don't have to do with language, the problems we have with our language today, and deciphering older languages, specifically uh, ancient Hebrew or proto sunniatic so that we can try to understand um, one of our oldest and uh, definitely most proliferated uh, document types that we have, um, which is the compilation of all of the books that we currently hold um, as the Hebrew scriptures uh, or Old Testament. <clears throat> as I said in my last video, I would, I would ask anyone who has initial reservations concerning the Hebrew scriptures to do a, a couple of things for for your sake for the sake of the truth to first off um try to suspend judgment for now i've found with uh, my own past many of the judgments i had were based on misinformation things that other people taught me uh, that the Bible says or taught me about the God thereof that weren't true. Um, so many of the, um, the feelings I had towards the Hebrew Scriptures and the, um, the New Testament uh, Greek portions of what's known as the Bible, which is a compilation of a number of books and letters, really. You know, these, these strong feelings I had, of course, were all based on bad information. So, as I said, we can't really have a meaningful, um, even a meaningful uh, disagreement about uh, the Hebrew scriptures it, until we fully understand them. And as I've said many times, we don't right now fully understand uh, many of the things that are being said because unfortunately uh, the, the Masoretes have really distorted 
our understanding of what extant Hebrew scriptures there are. I do believe they are preserved. I do also believe that as I go along in this, that something I'm going to have to do and something that others are going to have to do who are serious about the language and getting to know um, the source Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew, that the Bible, the books of the Bible was actually written in, um, we're going to have to actually seek out all of the single source manuscripts that there are and actually pull the interpretations, the translations from them. Because unfortunately, right now, what we have to work with are, uh, they are compilations. They are uh, United Bible Society, Nestle, Allen, compilations uh, put together over the years by scholars who decided to basically take uh, variant readings and use, in a way, a ABCD sort of voting system for the various readings. And then usually, by way of popular vote, decide which version of what book and what verses would go together for a homogenized text that they would then present to the academic theological world for use in further translations, which of course we know have to stay a certain amount different than the other translations that are extant, or they can't put their own special copyright on it and then sell it to all of us unwitting boobs. So that's one thing. The second thing is I would greatly implore anyone who uh, has not spent the time yet to, uh, to get to understand the, uh, the very rudimentary core difference between uh, those people who are called Jews today and the Israelites and House of Judah from the Hebrew Scriptures. There is an absolute night and day difference, and I must say that uh, those people who are known as Jews today have done so much in the way of um, maligning the name and reputation of the Hebrew Scriptures and the God represented in the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, they have done as much, if not far more damage, than those people uh, who for some time have claimed to be Christians and have in no way reflected the character or the person or the work of this man, Yahshua of Nazareth, um, represented in uh, the New Testament. So if we could suspend uh, just a few things, any prejudices, and, and definitely remove uh, the idea that today's so-called Jews are in any way uh, an equivalent with the Israelites or the house of Judah, which those are distinct as well in the Hebrew scriptures. Um, I believe that we'll all be uh, very uh, much better equipped to find out what exactly uh, the Hebrew Scriptures are saying, and again, until we can determine precisely what they are saying, I don't really see how we can have um, a fully meaningful conversation on them, much less a debate.
And given the fact that these documents are amongst our oldest and most well preserved and proliferated in a number of ways, it behooves us, no matter what our current views on them be, to understand what they do in fact say. So, even though I've been putting off for some time uh, the second character in the ancient Hebrew alphabet, um, which is called today Bet, but I'm going to be referring to it mostly as B, and you'll understand why as we go. The first thing that I don't like about the fact that it is named Bet is because right now all of these characters that are represented today in what I call modern Jewish or modern Jewish Syriac, which you will see here, it is the second character from the right. It is represented uh, in a relatively similar way to what the actual Hebrew is, which is over here on the far left. The issue is they have given names to all of these characters. Now, I actually don't yet know exactly when these names were given to the characters or when they actually stuck, but I'm going to do everything I can to avoid these names. The reason being, for instance, that this character is called Bet. Now, if you go to a concordance and find Bet, you will see that the Hebrew word Bet means house. And so it just furthers the work of today's gatekeepers to show you this image which by the way this image to the far left which i am you know representing as ancient hebrew you have to understand that even this has been stylized i have begun to amass what um actual representations there are of these characters on um, whether it be potsherds or stone uh, or uh, on whatever medium that they have been found on uh, because I find that those are the most telling images of these characters. Um, what has happened since uh, the discovery and the um, making public of these ancient Hebrew or proto sunniatic characters is that um, the actual original character on the original thing that it's on uh, has been taken and has been stylized, as you see here. And that's a big problem as far as I'm concerned. So, what they do is they take the name that it's uh, given in modern Jewish, which is Beit, and they apply it to uh, this uh, character here, and they say that um, since it's Beit, meaning house, that this is a picture of a house, a f uh, like an overhead view, a floor plan if you will, of a house, that that's what it is and that's what it means. Well, one of the most telling things I've found so far <clears throat> in studying this is that uh, if, if you go up, since there is actually a, a lot of Phoenician um, on a number of different mediums that are in the public domain, um, and there is some Middle Shemitic, and there is some Late Shemitic. There is also, keep in mind, um, Etruscan. There is, if you go back to 
not only classical Greek, but even older than classical Greek. And I know that uh, a lot of the manuscripts that we have right now, biblically speaking, as far as like uh, Codex Vaticanus, which would contain not only the Septuagint, but um, uh, the letters and Gospels of the New Testament as we know it. Even that Greek is more modern than older Greek alphabets that we know of. The older the Greek characters that you can find, you'll see these forms actually in them as well. And it's really helpful. The more of these alphabets that you can look at uh, and the characters, um, as the more that you can see those characters in their original form, uh, the more it should help us to understand what exactly this original character or icon or pictograph was and what it is communicating to us. So it should be pretty obvious when you look at uh, this even stylized version of the ancient Hebrew B, why I am just referring to it as B. Just like in the last video I did, which was the so-called Aleph, which I will call A, or A. Ah. That's the sound it makes, is actually A. Ah. This makes the sound B. The next character in the alphabet makes the sound G. Just like most of our modern English letters. So the B. Now there's a lot of words, I'm going to go over uh, at least some of them, that I have gone through and listed from Strong's that are two character parent root words. Um, I call them parent root words because uh, these are the words that I believe are going to give us the most insight on the three character words, the four, five, six plus character words, um, because the smallest um, thought that can be expressed, at least in this language, is two characters put together. Uh, now, a lot of the gatekeepers, when I say a lot, it's kind of silly because there's not actually very many people working in the ancient Hebrew, but amongst the people that I'm currently aware of that are, for the most part, um, I see gatekeepers or people that just aren't taking the time to think for themselves and figure out these things for themselves, but they're just regurgitating what the gatekeepers are saying. So, a two-character word, it's about the smallest um, form of an expression that we can find. And yeah, um, most people that are even relatively familiar with ad hoc Hebrew, and ad hoc Hebrew, of course, makes its way um, into Yiddish which um, Yiddish is what most uh, modern-day um, so-called Jews use as their base language. Yiddish is kind of a twisted German that has a lot of ad hoc Hebrew uh, to it. So a lot of you might be familiar with uh, just terms like Ben. I mean, we see it all the time um, in uh, the so-called Jews' last names. You got, you know, like Ben Gurion. You'll see Ben Yosef. Okay, so Ben was. Uh, it's a way of saying uh, son of. So they say. I'm not even sure that son of is the best translation of Ben just because of the context that I've seen it in for the most part. But 
you, I know you'll all be relatively familiar with that two-character parent root, Ben. Uh, there's also Bar, and depending on if we're talking about Hebrew or Aramaic, um, it is said that Bar is used as sort of an equivalent to Ben. And it is true that Aramaic is uh, an extremely similar language to Hebrew with some variations. Um, so I guess what I'd, I'd like to start with, I just want to give you my impressions and uh, any and all comments concerning what you may think that, that this character means what it's representing or what we're supposed to understand about it they're all really appreciated because uh, I'm not making this video as your teacher I'm not making this video as an expert or the authority I'm making this video in the spirit of truth and trying to disseminate and understand the truth so for me with everything I've seen so far with the use of this character B for one thing you have to understand that it's one of the most common prefixes added on to another word and I'm going to give you a really good example. If I'm trying to figure out any Hebrew character, what I'm typically going to do is I'm going to go to Genesis chapter 1. And I'm going to look for the first occurrence of that character. Because that's going to tell me a lot about it. If the first occurrence of that character doesn't tell me a lot about it, like uh, say here in the very first word, which would be barashit. Um, the the say the th the th at the end. Um, this word itself and this occurrence of the th at the end might not tell me a, a whole ton about the th here, but if I can find a word that's a little bit shorter that, say, starts with the th, like here, I've got theum. Uh, that word is probably going to tell me a lot more about that character. Uh, so anyways, um, the entirety of the Hebrew scriptures in Genesis 1-1 starts with the character B. We have B-ra-sheath. And... I have to say, I'm not going to argue with the translation of the B as a prefix meaning in. Um, every time I've seen the B uh, prefixed on to any Hebrew word, I would say wholeheartedly that, yeah, in. In is probably the best direct translational word that there is in. Now, I think that it's important to always consider why any of these characters are able to be used as a prefix, keeping in mind that in English, our, our prefixes, they're not the same thing as prefixes are in a language like ancient Hebrew, wherein every character bears its own distinct meaning. So we can put a prefix on a word in English, and simply, we, you know, we have our fiat lexicography in English. We've got our Merriam-Webster. So we can reference that. And if we run into a prefix or a suffix that we're not very familiar with, we can go to our predetermined fiat lexicographies and find out what that means. But with a language like Hebrew 
And I'm going to try to phase out me always saying ancient Hebrew. All right, this character you see right here, this is what I consider Hebrew. This right here, I know that this character right here is what you're seeing here. I understand that. And no, I don't believe that this character is an accurate representation of Hebrew, but that's what they're calling it today. And even though I don't consider it to be an equivalent, I'm going to be referring to it just as Hebrew, as opposed to ancient Hebrew. So please, bear with me on that. So in, in Hebrew, this B, it has its own meaning. It, it has its own meaning whether it is somewhere in a, a child root, like Ben. Um, it has its own meaning if it's in a prefix like this. It, it has its own meaning if it's at the end of a, a longer word. It always has to bear an inherent value. It always has to come with uh, its own lexicography. So even if it's used as a prefix, like for instance, in the next verse you see u uh, being used as a prefix. These days they call it vav or wa. I call it what it sounds like, u. There's a lot of speculation over what this character is and what it means. But I believe we always have to consider the context of it if it is a character that's used as a prefix and what that prefix means or is alluding to. I think that gives us a lot of understanding uh, concerning what the character should mean in general, even when it's used in regular words, not as a prefix. So I think it is very strong evidence that the B means in. Berashith. Um, most people would uh, translate that as <clears throat> in the beginning. Um, I think uh, the Concordat Publishing Concerns uh, translation, uh, which is in a beginning, is actually uh, more accurate than most of it, these English translations because the uh, the uh, e the the eth there at the end is a type of diminutive. So I don't believe that this word is stating so much the beginning as in a sense a beginning. And in fact I've been working on my own translation uh, of Genesis which it's taking time but um, I, I'll digress from that. So with B, there was a couple of words that I had hoped, anyways, would help. Uh, one of them actually being pronounced uh, bad. And uh, I'm going to handwrite uh, these characters here. Here I'm handwriting what is sort of the stylized version of D which today is called Dalit. And then you know, next to it here, you know, that's the stylized version of the B, what is today called Bet. And of course, Hebrew being read from right to left. So this is Bad. <clears throat> the reason I'm starting with Bad is because, as everybody knows who speaks English, that the letters B here and, and the letter D as shown here right next to it, <laughs> not very well drawn by my mouse, but anyways, you know what a D is, you know what a B is. They're very similar. They're very, very similar. And I don't find these things to be accidental. In fact, 
if you look through, as I, I mentioned, a lot of those alphabets from various peoples uh, down through time, and I don't know how well I'm going to, if I'm going to get lucky on this or not, but I'm, I'm actually just highlighting the uh, Phoenician slash Moabite version of B here, and I'm just going to hit D real quick right there. Notice that? Now, it doesn't have the stem that the Phoenician Moabite had, but it does have quite a similar form. If you asked me, let me get that and go back to B. It's the same thing here with these stylized versions of B and D. I do think they're quite similar. Let's see what the Shemitic middle gives us when we hit D instead of B. Again, I would say that that's quite similar. I would think that these two characters are both telling us something kind of similar. And I'm going to show you some reasons why I think that is. Let's go to... I've got uh, the concordance up. And I'm at H905. Which is the word... Bud. <clears throat> okay. If if you go down here, and uh, what I always encourage is that you do cross cross reference searches. Cross reference searches on any particular word, they are so revealing. As far as ways that these words were used translationally. That's revealing in one way, even though I think a lot of the translations of these words is pretty shoddy at best. But what else is really revealing is you'll find these, uh, these very odd passages in which the same word uh, that was used in, say, the last dozen or so passages is used in a very specific way. Now, all of a sudden, the very exact same word departs so much from the way it had been being used. And the reason that happens, in my opinion, is because the translators are not translating these words in a very consistent manner. So they get caught up. Um, and so I think that doing these cross-reference searches, as I always encourage people to do, it just gives you a great illustration of how irresponsible so many of our translations are. And this, this is a, before I, get, I go into bad and what bad means, I'm going to give you the, an illustration of that real fast, okay? So the first occurrence, Genesis 26.1. And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine. So there's Bad beside the first famine. So separate, set apart from the first famine. It is distinct. Okay, so second occurrence, Exodus 12, 37. Um, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. Okay, so now we're getting in a groove, right? So then we get to Exodus 25, 13. And you shall make staves of shittim wood. Staves. Really? <laughs> staves. And again, Exodus 25, 14. It's staves. Exodus 25, 15. Staves. 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 And it's still, we're going with staves. Now, it since a lot of this is going to be instructions for how to um, build certain uh, items for the tabernacle, um, it stays with staves for a number of verses, right? So, once we get, though, to Exodus 30, 34, 
And Yahweh said to Moses, Take unto thee sweet spices, stacte and onika and gal galbanum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense. Of each shall there be a like weight. Listen, guys. That's that word. That's the same word. Bad for that they translate they translate as each and they translate as like now you tell me that there's any sort of consistency going on here now for the next few occurrences we got stave 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 staves stave 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 oh and then we get to leviticus 917 besides Stave, stave, staves. Oh, Deuteronomy 1 9. And I spake unto you at the time, saying, I am not able to bear you myself alone. Alone. Okay. All right. Now, given the fact that we do have these Masoretic Nikud, smeared all over um, what full Hebrew codices we know of, anyways, that are not kept hidden right now. There's only so much that they could actually encode and hide with their Nikud. But if we have these basic characters in these words, you know, at most, they could have possibly encoded or hid a character here and there. Which, don't get me wrong, one character can affect the meaning of a word. But in general, I think that we're going to have to start seeing certain patterns in these certain words apart from the Masoretic Nakud, to start understanding the way that we're supposed to understand the characters we're looking at. So it seemed so strange to me that the same word could be translated as besides or alone or, you know, set apart from. That was being translated as staves. At the same time, there was something that, a week or two ago, really struck me as odd. You see, I'm at a word right now that is Strong's H7626. It is Shabbat. Now, a lot of people that are familiar with Ad Hoc Hebrew are going to think Shabbat. Well, that means uh, the seventh day of the week, right? That's rest. Shabbat. No, uh, not in this occurrence. Shabbat actually is translated Genesis 49.10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. This scepter. Interesting. So it, then it means scepter, a rod. A, well, a scepter. But in Genesis 49, 16, six verses later, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. And again, Genesis 49, 28, all these are the twelve tribes of Israel. What about Exodus 20, 21? If a man shall smite his servant or his maid with a rod, not a tribe, not a scepter, a rod. What I find so interesting about some of these things that I'm seeing is so often times, uh, like for instance, the house of Judah and the house of Israel are described at at least one point in the Hebrew Scriptures as two sticks, two rods, two pieces of wood. 
And by the way, the word that is most commonly translated as tree, which would be oats, is also used just for a piece of wood. Now, I think that there's something far more profound to that use of wood and rods and sticks so often. And I think that one day it's definitely going to be revealed. But for right now, we are at Bad. We do see that it is translated as set apart. And that it's also translated as staves here. And that was really tough for me to try to think about why would these two characters here, the B and the D, when put together, they could mean a stave. Whereas in many other contexts, they of course clearly mean set apart, alone, or separate. So I had to look at the other occurrences of Bad. Um, and the three occurrences of that parent root, the two character parent root Bad, are 905, 906, and 907. So if we go forward now to 906, we're going to again be at Bad with a slightly different Nakud, of course. And now you may think this is pretty strange, but the definite the definition of bod in 906 is actually linen or white linen. Now there's kind of a reason for this and I, I had to do some looking and searching for linen to find out what might be the reason for this. But as you do a context search cross-referencing it, you'll find that Linen does seem really appropriate for this use or occurrence of Bad. Exodus 28.42, And you shall make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. Exodus 39.28, uh, A miter of, well look, fine linen, but it's not listed there. So obviously that's another word that they just decided would be linen there. I can't stand the way these translators do things and goodly bonnets of fine linen. There it is again, and it's not coated. All right, and then finally, and linen. And here we got linen right there. That verse right there would be something that you could just take apart. Uh, good luck, King James only people. I'm sorry. And the priest shall put on his linen garments. So there it is, linen again. And his linen breeches shall he put upon his flesh. Uh, and he shall put on holy, I'm not a big fan of the word holy, um, set apart linen, um, which is interesting, that whole set apart idea. And that's something we can talk about later. So anyways, you, you, you cross-reference it and linen makes a whole lot of sense. Even though I first didn't know why linen would make a whole lot of sense until I looked into how linen is made. So, um, with linen, you take the uh, stalk of flax, and there are fibers within the stalk of flax. And when those fibers then are woven together, they create this fabric, linen. And so thinking about that, this, this idea of linen actually comes from a fiber that's within the stalk of flax, and then going back to these characters, the B and the D, when put together, would be linen. In a way, I suppose since uh, they are linen put together, there's probably a lot of symbolism to be uh, extracted from linen. And why linen is being used for the breeches and the ephod, uh, or the, uh, the, head, uh, the headdress, I suppose you could say, of the priests. 
But the interesting thing is the fact that those fibers that you make linen from, they come within the stalk of the flax plant. So, um, again, looking at the characters, the B and the D, and thinking about what these two could mean. And then thinking about the last occurrence of Bod and what that means and how it's used used as set apart, or alone, or separate, and then it being used, <clears throat> excuse me, as staves. Now, I don't know exactly <clears throat> what he meant was when he said bad, because remember, the Masoretes are adding these Nakud to the scriptures. So, for all I know, the bod that was used in the portions of Exodus where Yahweh is describing these um, staves that would be used to carry the Ark of the Covenant, um, for all I know, what he was using was the same word which would have indicated a flax stalk or bundle of stalks. Um, of course, the modifier there of some kind of wood is present. But there does seem to be a far closer relationship between the 905 bad and the 906 bad. When we go forward, so again, all of these uh, occurrences in the 906 is, is linen, essentially or something that would have to be quite similar. Okay, so when we go to the last occurrence of Bad, which is 907, this is the one that is the head scratcher, because Strong's is going to give you, as a simple definition, empty talk, idle talk, liar, or lie. And I find that just perplexing. Now, the funny thing is, this this is what always gets me too, as I'm going through and listing these two character parent roots. When I find them specifically in books like Job, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, it seems like a lot of the words that I'm finding that have like those uh, uh, kind of more seldom occurrences, they pop up a lot in, in these books, and it makes me wonder sometimes if uh, the, the people who wrote these books, uh, in the case of Isaiah, Isaiah and Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I don't know who wrote Job. I don't know if it was him or, uh, or somebody else. Sometimes seems to me like um, maybe they had a broader vocabulary. Or maybe this is one of the occurrences of this two-letter root where uh, the Masoretes had simply taken away one of the vowels and replaced it with their Nikud. This uh, Nikud right here would give us the ah sound like uh, as it was an Aleph. And if there was an Aleph originally in here, it would change the word enough. So... Strangely enough, we see it in uh, six occurrences. First one, Job 11.3. Should thy lies make men hold their peace? And when thou mock, uh, shall no man make thee ashamed? And then Job 41.12. I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportion. Interesting. We really need to look at those in um, in context, and I don't have uh, eSword open. I may have to open it. Now, Isaiah 16.6, 6, We have heard the pride of Moab. He is very proud, even of his haughtiness and his pride and his wrath, but his lies shall not be so. Isaiah 44.25, That frustrateth the tokens of liars and makes diviners mad. Jeremiah 48.30, I know his wrath, says Yahweh, but 
It shall not be so. His lies shall not so affect it. And then Jeremiah 50, 36. A sword is upon the liars, and they shall dote. A sword is upon her mighty men, and they shall be dismayed. Just looking at these six occurrences um, makes me a little bit leery. Um, is it supposed to mean lies? Is it supposed to denote something more like the other two occurrences of Bod, which is in a sense um, set apart? Or does it actually mean, in a sense, if you'll bear with me on this, back at Job 11.3, uh, 11, should thy inner concealment make men hold their peace? Or maybe Job 41.12, I will not conceal his inward concealment, nor his power. Isaiah 16.6, 6, um, even of his haughtiness and his pride and his wrath, but his inner concealment shall not be so. Or that frustrates the tokens of the inward concealers. Maybe what Bod should be in this occurrence is more uh, deceit or deceitful. To conceal something within, which would typically be to conceal, uh, sorry, to deceive. So if that would be the case, then we could look at these three occurrences of Bod and maybe look back at the initial characters here, the B and the D, because I know we're supposed to be talking about B. And maybe what we're supposed to see here is for the character B, the so-called bet, maybe not so much as a house floor plan, but as denoting in, but not in, in the sense of hidden, not in the sense of entirely concealing, but maybe more in the sense that if I were to, um, walk into the parameter of a three-sided fence, I would be in, but not concealed. Perhaps the D, being closed off as it is, is quite similar to the B, but in the sense that we have something entirely concealed inside. This is so far my best guess. I don't want to say that B is a floor plan. I don't want to go the route that Jeff Benner and a number of other um, men who are teaching ancient Hebrew are going where they're comparing all of these characters to uh, all kinds of nomadic symbols and Bedouin life. I think that's just one more way to confuse these things. Because what he's doing is he's giving all of us a sense that... Um, The people that are being spoken to and spoken about in these scriptures are backwards Bedouins, you know, I mean, just barely out of the Stone Age morons. Um, and, it, and it really, it just goes back to um, the same kind of thought process that basically invents this idea of the God of the gaps, wherein we give none of our 
far distant ancestors much credit at all for being anything but um i think backwards sort of people i'm not saying that none of them dwelt in tents what i'm saying is even if some of them did dwell in tents because um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and his brother Esau, they were all moving around. They weren't moving every day. Abraham set up, and we're gonna, we'll get into the word that they're using for tent at some point too, and examine that. Anyways, he set up his dwelling um, by the Oaks of Mamre. Um, and he actually dwelt there for a very long time. But what he wasn't doing was, he wasn't establishing with stone or brick and mortar um, per a permanent dwelling place. Okay, but just because uh, those patriarchs weren't establishing a permanent dwelling place does not automatically equal them being like the Bedouins that we know of today. And, and that's one of the, uh, in my opinion, the subtle uh, and, and sometimes insidious teachings that are out there about the ancient Hebrew character is by trying to uh, subconsciously introduce into our thought process that all of these characters were all in the context of what we know today as Bedouins, all Middle Eastern. Think, think Palestine. Think Middle East. Think desert. You see, it's subtle, but it's deceiving. So everything I see so far about the bee, the so-called bet, is telling me that it's in, but it is not concealed. But if we see that B and the D together, or the so-called Bet and so-called Dalit, and we're getting words in context that are working when translated as alone, or separate, or linen, when we understand the way that linen is made and where it comes from, being those fibers within the flax stalk. Or even if we understand that it can be used for concealing deception, I think this starts to form a pattern of, in a sense, bear with me, um, in, within. And I know that that doesn't necessarily help to utterly clarify these things. But remember, I'm just some regular, very plain, simple guy that is a carpenter for, from Indiana, for crying out loud. And I'm, I'm trying to figure these things out. And they're... They're big things, and they're big issues. I'm not coming to you with any pretense, and I'm not putting on any hairs. I'm telling you what I've found. I'm telling you what I know. And I'm trying to do the best here to broaden um, my understanding and your understanding. Because if all of us really are on a pursuit of the truth. Um, 
I'm thinking that this information can do nothing but um, edify us. So, a few other things, I think, um, that should be considered uh, when we're talking about B. And I'm going to select uh, these things here so I can get rid of them. Um, oh, I forgot my, er, my delete button on this computer doesn't work. Because some of my some of my buttons on my laptop they stopped working, and I had a guy at the computer store put in a new a new keyboard part of my laptop. Okay, but uh, what unfortunately happened was that even when he put it in, he he said that there was like something wrong with the processor. Oh, good that that delete works. I'm glad I have multiple deletes on this keyboard. Um, but he said when he put in the new keyboard that <clears throat> um, because of the, I don't know, the circuitry, the motherboard, whatever it was, that some of those keys, they just weren't going to work. And uh, his answer was, get a new laptop. Well, my answer was, I'm poor, buddy. Um, so the alternative was to get an outboard keyboard. And of course, with an outboard keyboard, it takes up one of my USB ports. <laughs> so when I want to record, the microphone goes into a USB port, right? And I have to have my mouse because I'm old school and I can't finger mouse. It just drives me crazy. Um, so this is what I got to work with. Um, so anyways, yeah, back to more B. Okay, a couple other, other words to consider that I'm not going to go into with as much depth, but just to give you a good idea of some things, okay? Um... Interesting stuff. And, and of course, now, uh, the, the order, I'm sorry, the order that these characters appear in, they're important. Um, if I can go forward here, I've got all of these, uh, these notes written down as, as I've, uh, as I've listed these things. Um, all right. So listen, I can also find, um, the D and the B in in you know the reverse order um and the funny thing is when i find them there's two occurrences of dab instead of bad there's two occurrences one is h1677 and the other is h1678 the 1678 is aramaic but they're both translated as bear the same characters in the other direction. So um, here, H1677, okay? Um, and there it is. It's just the same characters in reverse. Look at right there, short definition, bear. Um, first seen in 1 Samuel 17, 34, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion <coughs> and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And again, 1 Samuel 17, 36, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. Now, if this is one of the occurrences where the lexicography is correct, and that does mean bear, I guess my first thought is this. Since we've got the same characters as um, in bad, which, you know, um, is used for, for set apart and, and things like that, but the, they're in the opposite order. So here I'm going to give you these characters in their glorious stylized sort of way. So there we have Dab. And it's used as bear, not only by the Hebrew, but, but by Aramaic. So the two occurrences, it's bear. And when I look at this and I think about it, I think maybe that animal is called Dab because of the fact that it is one of the most well-known large animals that typically tend to dig in and hibernate over the winter. 
a dad, a bear. So then we have this sense of going in, concealing, I guess. Now with the B, again, that's in, but it doesn't have to be concealed, just in. And then the D. Now I don't know exactly what the D means. I'm doing a lot of speculating here. And I'm hoping that this gives you guys some light and, and maybe you can shine that light back to me. But the D is going to have to mean something to us to where when we put that D and that B together, knowing that that B is in, that that tells us why that animal that we know as the bear is called Dab by both the Hebrew and the Aramaic portions. Dab. Unless the lexicography is incorrect. And if that's the case, then I'm sure as we all learn more about the Hebrew characters, we'll be able to figure that out. So it's interesting, right? I mean, when you reverse the order of these characters, you are going to get a different meaning. Um, so, back to um, my B characters. Something I, th I found to be really interesting as well is how... Um, this word. And I'm sure um, just about all of you are going to be familiar with this word that I'm going to put up right here, okay? Here is B L. And um, we've got Bell. Now, in uh, Babylonian or Chaldean, there's Bell. Bell is uh, one of their deities. If you remember, they, they renamed Daniel. Belteshazzar, uh, one of the sons of uh, Nebuchadnezzar was Belshazzar, Bel. The, uh, one of the extra chapters in Daniel included in the Apocrypha is called Bel and the Dragon. And Bel um, was a deity. Bel. It was one of their deities. Now, uh, instantly, I'm sure a lot of people are going to think of Baal. Um, Baal Zabub, Baal Peor. Uh, Baal, this, this, just the, the straight BL is, is oftentimes used just to say, um, my Lord. And it's H1078. And, and that's actually one of the reasons that I avoid saying Lord um, as a title, I suppose, for, for the God of the Bible or his Messiah. I kind of avoid that because I know that the, the direct equivalent in Hebrew is actually Baal. And, and people, you know, we read all, the, all about the Baal worship, right, in the, in the Bible. But um, Baal, it's Lord. It means Lord. That's its direct translation. Um, and what I so you got Isaiah forty six one. Bel boweth down. Nebo stoops. Their idols were upon the beasts. Jeremiah fifty two. Babylon is taken. Bel is confounded. This is a it's a Chaldean deity. So, uh, going forward um, from 1078 is 1079. In Aramaic, this bell means the mind or heart in Aramaic, which is a very similar language to Hebrew. And, of course, it only has one occurrence. It's Daniel 6.14. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself. And he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. Okay, fair enough. Now, the one thing that uh, vexes me is when you go back to 
bell as used in 1077, <laughs> the short definition of it is not, hardly, or else. So, you go ahead and spend the time going through all of those references and try to understand why they would use it as not, hardly, else, and, neither, no. Unfortunately, I've found that to be the case with a lot of these two-character parent roots, is them being used um, not only for meaningful words, but oftentimes for those words which are actually just con conjunctive, or oftentimes prepositional, or pronouns. That's one of the things that's really vexing me a lot. Uh, strangely, though, enough with Bell, when you take Bell and you, uh, you just change the order of these characters, which I'm going to do here real quick. Right there is the, the B, okay, and then the L uh, right here. And you've got Lob. And um, I'm going to show you what Lob is because um, I think it would be helpful for you to see Lob for yourself. And it's going to be H3820. And we're not going to spend a whole lot more time on this because I, I think that what I've shown here is enough to really get everybody who's watching or interested in this subject um, to get your mental faculties kind of kind of rolling along here, you know. All right, so um, lob. So we've got the B at the end here. We look at the short definition, inner man, mind, will, heart, or understanding. So all we got to do is switch around those letters from the bell, um, a Chaldean deity, to lab, which is the inner man, the mind, or the heart. And remember, bell was used in Aramaic in one occurrence in Daniel for heart inside the heart um, and it's these are a lot of occurrences by the way um, this word lob you, you scroll down and it's got all of these pages that you can go to to look at all the occurrences look at all of these it's 11 pages uh, chocked full with probably about 20 or so examples of, of an occurrence okay and You'll just end up going through this and, and you'll find out, even starting at Genesis 6 5, um, the imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Or Genesis 6 6, um, Yahweh, that he made the man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. Genesis 8 21, that's Yahweh's heart, okay? Uh, and Yahweh smelled a sweet savor, and Yahweh said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground. And Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, And comfort ye your hearts, after that ye shall pass on. And before I had done speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder. This man telling this story was um, thinking inside himself. We've all done that. We know what that is. Now look, in Genesis 27, 41, it says, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Inside. Now Genesis 31, 20, And Jacob stole away unaware to Laban. They seriously just translated the same word that they translated as heart. Bunch of times, unaware. Do you think that perhaps that word that we're looking at, lab, an L and a B, has something to do with inside? And that L, I'm sorry, but I got to tell you, the gatekeepers usually um, give that definition of that L as a... Um, a shepherd's staff and as I showed it to you here it's it's usually represented 
you know, uh, like that. And of course, it bears a striking resemblance to our modern L. So I call it L. The, the biggest problem I have, you know, when, when they call it the, sh the shepherd's staff, is that if I were representing a shepherd's staff or something, I don't know. I don't know if I would have represented it like that, you see, upright. But I suppose if if that was used a lot, I mean, it, you you would use the you would use the hook end here probably quite a lot. I've never shepherded, but I'm gonna look into it. Not shepherding. I'm not gonna get like you know a bunch of sheep, but I'm gonna look into the way that the staff is used. So that's interesting. That what they keep translating as heart is this lob, this L and this B. The B just has to be in, I'm thinking, unless you guys, any of you, are getting something else from that, thinking something else, uh, but then the L. Now, some people have, have said that um, this would be... Um, the shepherd within, or some people have said that the shepherd's staff represents teacher, so that's the teacher within. But I'll tell you this, I've seen words, uh, I, 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 uh, I list them, I'm sorry, I list them with the double L, and uh, I'm not picking up on shepherd's staff so much, uh, but if it is, I don't know that what we're supposed to be getting out of it is teaching or authority or shepherd so much as perhaps what we're supposed to be getting from it is um, control, like directional control. And I've got a lot of reason for thinking that because, um, like I said, I list all of the three character uh, parent roots that have a double character in there. So a word like balal, I'll list that and I'll see what it means. And um, you can kind of tell that what's going on in that word is oftentimes a double turn. In fact, I can look at it real quick. I would have it right here on my first page of the words listed um, with the double letters. And, um, and yeah, and there it is. Uh, there's only one occurrence of it uh, listed, Balal. It's H1101, and it's used as mix, mingle, or confuse. You, okay, so if it is used as um, mix, mingle, or confused, and I said it's 1101, is the Strong's number for it. I'm going to punch it in. Let's look. Balal. Okay. To mix, mingle, confuse, confound. Um, it's really interesting the way that, that these Hebrew words are used together and how poetic it is because you have Babel, which is confusion, and it's a double B with an L. I've got it listed right here. And then you've got Balal with the, the double L. But it's, it's quite similar in ways. So in Genesis 11, 7, um, go to, let us go down, and there confound their language. Balal, confound. Um, in Genesis 11, 9, therefore the name of it is called Babel, because Yahweh did there Balal, the language. Exodus 29, 2, and unleavened bread and cakes unleavened, tempered with oil. I would have to think that that actually means mixed up with, and that this probably also means mixed up. Um, and then Exodus 29, 40, and with the one lamb, a tenth deal of, I'm sorry, a tenth deal of flour, mingled, mixed up, mixed in. Balal, mixed in. Usually when I see that double L, it seems to me like we're talking about a double turn. 
And the reason I say that is because I came across another word that was two L's, and um, the actual translation that was used for it was a, a staircase, like a spiral staircase. And I found that to be interesting. Um, and then you have sort of, uh, you've got like galal, which in Aramaic is like a great rolling stone, or you've got galal in Hebrew, which used as dung. And I, of course, always think of the dung beetle. Um, but thinking of like rolling, um, to roll, it's actually used as a verb, to roll, galal. So, balal, meaning to mix or mix up, and then lab, meaning the inner man. If that, if that L is trying to communicate to us directional, and the B is in, I would think that that would have something to do with, I know they translate it as heart, and of course I don't really think that they're talking about an organ that works with the um, circulatory system and the blood necessarily. But we all have an inner person. We you know, think in our inner person, we have conversations in our inner person, we all have an inner person. This is the lab, that's our inner person. That word is translated a lot, and typically, um, always or for the most part, being that inner person. I think that that's really interesting that they translated it as unawares, but I would think that um, if we look at that in context, that what we would find is that it is the same um, meaning that we should derive from that. And it would mean that, you know, um, Jacob did that quietly, secretly. He didn't, he didn't pronounce it. Now, in Genesis 34, 3, it says, And his soul claved unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel, and he spake kindly unto the damsel. I wonder if what that means when they use lob there, when they say they spake kindly unto the damsel, if that means that he was intimate with her, Lab. It's always so um, rewarding to do the cross-reference searches of these words because you find some really interesting stuff as far as what they translated, what they tried to get away with in their translations. Yeah. So... There aren't, right now, um, there's, all right, there's a couple others, real quick, bringing to your attention, basic uh, two-character um, parent roots. <laughs> of course, I already told you that in Aramaic, the B and the R um, and typically the, the R, and I've seen a lot of the original like on stone uh, and other mediums version of the R, and I would have to tell you in general it does look like a man's head. So yes, I do believe that the R is representing a man's head in general. And I'm going to see if I can get this, you know, like, okay, but I'm not sure that I will. <laughs> a lot of times... You know, literally, that's kind of right there is what you would see for an R, that sort of a thing, you know. Um, so, you know, when I make it, I just make it like that, and I'm thinking, here we go, we got a man's head. And so in Aramaic, when you put that B with that, 
They use it as sun, but I've seen it so much more often used as like air. Um, like the, uh, not just a sun, but the firstborn sun being the air. Now, it's listed as being used for uh, pure or clean, which I find to be interesting. And we're not really going to go into the R today, which is the so-called rush. Um, it's listed as being translated as grain. Grain. And I, I got to comment on that real quick, too, because... <clears throat> with the R seemingly, I mean being just seemingly really clear as depicting a man's head. Now, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying right now what it is exactly denoting, but it is depicting a man's head, every uh, occurrence I've seen of it. And the B, together with that, as um, it is used as grain, the translation of grain, in the head is grain. I am spitballing here, but you know, and then again, it's clean or pureness, and then clean or pureness. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to go into a few of the other ones because I think it would be better to go into those when I get into the secondary character, you know, rather than to confuse the issue. But, um, yes, please do consider this character right here. And um, everything I've been able to, to tell you about it. Um, and yeah, if you don't get the stylized version of that, what you usually end up with, and the way that I make it when I, I write out ancient Hebrew, I use a shorthand, and I make it like that. It's, it's quicker. It's easier. And I would imagine that that's why, um, like, for instance, you know, um, Middle Shemitic like that, or say, you know, Phoenician Moabite like that. But there's something to be said about this, like, if late Shemitic was actually like that, you know, that's, I find that to be fascinating. Because we always have to look at choices that they made. Because as far as the, the, the Middle Shemitic or the Phoenician Moabite, especially Phoenician, because there's a lot of uh, occurrences of Phoenician characters that we have, we got to pay attention to what they did because... I believe that the Phoenicians knew the inherent meanings of these characters. And so when they wrote them for whatever, their own documents, um, I do believe that they would want to keep a, uh, a sense of what these characters did originally mean. But then again, Maybe not. Maybe by then they were already stylizing these characters for themselves. Um, knowing what the characters meant, maybe it didn't really matter that much that they kept the form of them. And so they just stylized them. That happens. You know, people get too much time on their hands and they start coming up with calligraphy. You never know. So, of course, this isn't the end-all, be-all. This, um, this is one little stop, one little blump, uh, blip or bump um, in, on the road to understanding this language as a whole. And uh, I hope what bit of an offering I was able to get you today will be helpful to those of you who are interested in this language or those of you who are just interested in knowing better the Hebrew Scriptures just plain interested in the truth because these things are absolutely, utterly vital and important for us to understand where we come from, who we are, where we're going, the state of things today, and who everyone else is. What's going on? 
So sometimes it's not all that glorious nor entertaining to try to trudge through these things, but it's necessary. So I'll keep it up. I'll continue as long as you'll pray for me that I will continue in, in truth and uh, in honor and in sincerity than I will do. So until next time, everybody, please take care of yourself, okay, and your families and your loved ones, and, and be good. All right, bye.